So I said very lightly, and you got to watch what you wish for. I think I should go out with a rock band. And two days later, David Bowie called. <laughs> and, I <didn't, laughs> and I didn't know who he was. I owe my whole career to David. And he was that person that was the perfect casting director. Well, I'm diving in. Mike Garson, absolute pleasure to meet you and, and to see you and looking so great. I cannot, you must have done a deal with the devil. I cannot believe that you are 77 years of age. So let us, let's, let's rewind right to the beginning, actually to before what we're talking about. And just tell me in a nutshell what you were doing before you became a spider from Mars. Well, it was 1972, and I was a jazz musician and avant-garde musician and classical composer and piano teacher, and I was playing these jazz gigs in Greenwich Village in New York City uh, with the best players around at the time, people who played with Miles Davis and... Uh, I'd play in these clubs and believe it or not, there would be five people and make five dollars and I had a family and I'm thinking, this is not working. I've practiced my whole life and I can't have an existence like that. The, the rent at the time was $150, so I'd have to do 30 of those gigs a month to make $150 and then there's the phone and the car and the driving and all that stuff. So I realized Something's not right here. So I said very lightly, and you got to watch what you wish for. I think I should go out with a rock band. And two days later, David Bowie called. <laughs> and, I <didn't, laughs> and I didn't know who he was. <laughs> I was going to say, like, so, uh, I mean, so, well, you've answered my next question, which was going to be, what was your impression of Bowie in those days? But you were, you were so avant-garde that you didn't know Bowie. I didn't know him, and I think he loved that. Because then it's completely genuine, right? Whatever your reaction that you had. You know, and he loved jazz and he was a pretty decent saxophone player, but he knew he wasn't great enough for it. It, it, it worked out well for all of us and the fans because he did songwriting and singing and producing and everything he did. But he wanted actually to be the jazz sax player. So we would talk about jazz all the time. People like Charlie Mingus and Stan Kenton. He wanted to know about my piano teachers. He asked me more questions. I was about a year older than him. So he had a certain respect and everybody else was sort of kissing up to him. And I didn't know who he was. So it was like he had somebody he could look up to. And of course, as I got to know him, my respect and recognition of what an artist he was, a renaissance man. There were some concerts with the Spiders from Mars in 72 in America where I wasn't playing on some of the songs like With of a Circle, Mick Ronson was doing all that. And I would sneak out to the audience and because these shows were not sold out on the first American tour. And I'd sit in the first row and look up at David and think, this is a good gig. <laughs> And I was only hired for eight weeks, and then I ended up the longest standing member, 600 concerts, about 23 albums. Wow, that's amazing. That's interesting that you said, you know, people were kissing up to him, of course, because they knew who he was. He was a, he was a legend even then. But of course, it's easy to forget that pop stars are just humans, and you were just treating him as a human, and that must have been very refreshing for him. I think so, and it was a mutual respect. I didn't understand how he just kept hiring me because in those first two, three years from 72 to 75, he fired five different bands and I was the only one that remained. And it was more than friendship. It was because I could change styles with him. And I realized that our creative process and our aesthetic way of thinking were very similar, even though who we were and our lifestyles were very different. But and when it came down to the important stuff, we thought about music in similar ways. We both very impatient, moving on. Just when uh, you're in a comfort zone, you change and write new music. And I've done that my whole life with classical music and jazz. And of course, he did it in the pop. Uh, area and it was fantastic, you know, yeah. because people, the fans wanted another 18 months of Ziggy and he's off to the next project. Of course. And every single tour that we did, the last five or six gigs, he was done and already planning for the next tour. Wow. Or album. So, so let me ask, why you, Mike? Why did you get that call? 
from David? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> just think about this. They come to America. Uh, Rick Waitman had played on Hunky Dory and Life on Mars and Changes. He was already a studio musician in London, and I think Guess was putting their thing together. He comes to America with the Spiders, and there's no, there's no piano player. He happened to know this avant-garde singer, leave it to David and Mick Ronson, he knew Annette Peacock. And I had just played on her album, and she has a song called I'm the One that Mick Ronson actually uh, recorded, and I played on that a few years later. And he went over to Annette. He said, would you like to be the pianist in the band? And she said, oh, absolutely not me, but the person you should have is Mike Garson. And that's when the call came in, but it was... It was really wacky because I was giving a piano lesson sitting in Brooklyn. The studio in RCA was in New York City was 20 minutes from my house. I have a piano student there, first lesson. My daughter's one years old. She's next to the piano. She's rocking in a little glider. And I get this call. My wife is out working. And I run down to the studio for the audition, leave my daughter, one year old, with the the, the first lesson f with this piano student, my wife wanted to kill me when she found out. I walk into the room and Mick Ronson sitting at the piano, and David and the Spiders, the rest of the guys, Trevor and, and Woody, are in the control room. And he shows me the music, it changes, and says, play, and I sort of go... stops me he says you got the gig <laughs> that was the fastest audition in my life <laughs> oh, well i mean you know he knows what he's doing and obviously so do you so how did you gel with your bandmates because you know you're a, you're a an avant-garde new york jazz guy and these are kind of northern english session musicians i guess right i think uh i felt awkward initially because i felt like I was invading their space. This is this great English rock band, and I'm this guy playing crazy uh, avant-garde piano, and and then some music like on Changes sounded like show tunes and Life on Mars. I would play it different every night, and David was eating it up. But I felt a little strange because I loved the way the band sounded as is, but already David was looking to add, let's say, some whipped cream on the cake because they were solid as a band. But little by little, they became my friends and they embraced me and I learned how to play their way. And they were supportive of how I was playing. What was good about it is David knew how to frame me. So if I was playing some of that jazz stuff with uh, a jazz band, everybody would be playing avant-garde and free and kind of crazy. But here, this band is playing a solid beat in relationship to my wild stuff. So that made for the magic. Mm. And if you go back to that moment, the first moment that you and David met, was uh, presumably at that audition, right? What were your you, what were your impressions? What were your first impressions of him that day? Or that well, you got to understand, this is in the middle of the week, about seven in the evening, <clears throat> and these guys were decked out like they were going to play at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> Every one of them, had, just like you see in all the pictures, the most gorgeous clothes, the great hairdos. Uh, Mick Ronson had these boots and going up to his knee and it, it just, each hair color was gorgeous. David was absolutely exquisite. And I'm thinking, I'm in a, in a t shirt with <laughs> jeans. Where am I? <laughs> I'm going to have to raise my game here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, I'm hired and my whole life shifted because every band who has hired me to play on their albums, meaning Nine Inch Nails, Smashing Pumpkins, Duran Duran, Def Leppard, all grew up listening to my playing with David on the Aladdin Sane album and Diamond Dogs and Young Americans. And they hired me, so I owe my whole career to David. And he was that person that was the perfect casting director. Everyone who he ever hired was the perfect person, whether it was Mick Ronson or Woody 
or Sterling Campbell or Zach Olford or Gail Ann Dorsey, uh, his producers Ken Scott or Tony Visconti, Carlos Alamo, every person was just the right person. And when he didn't feel that person didn't belong on an album, had nothing to do with friendship, he just didn't have them. Consequently, I'm not on every album and nobody is. So he had that gift of being uh, tuned in. He managed to find anything I had practiced on the piano the prior 10, 15 years of my life, eight hours a day, every style that I studied, he found a way for a song that he wrote for me to play that way. For example, Lady Grinning Soul, very romantic of Aladdin Sane, very avant-garde. The song Time has like old jazz style with a twist of avant-garde from the 1930s piano playing. And anything that I did, whether it was on the outside album, uh, um, Heart's Filthy Lesson, a lot of classical stuff like Tchaikovsky and Franz Liszt. And I mean, he, he had a magic about him uh, like a friend of mine is kind of psychic and after David passed he told me he had this dream and it was like he saw David having like the way we have two hands he, he, he saw a third limb for this guy an extra body part it was sort of a metaphor for that he just wasn't like the rest of us on that level on a creative level and uh, I think he was right right I have a I actually have a question uh from our drive time host Ricky uh, Ricky Wilson Ricky is a famous pop star in this country he's sold millions of records and plays in stadiums and stuff we're very uh, lucky to have him and when I told him I was interviewing you he said actually I've got a question will you ask him this for me he said w at what point did they say to you you're going to have to wear makeup for this gig and were you on board with it? And was everybody else on? Did you get a sense of who was on board or was there pushback on it? Well, what happened is first, uh, before I joined, the band was very reluctant. And then they ended up loving and embracing it. I also was a little reluctant. And once it went on and I saw that the audience appreciated that, I I was loving it. So, I mean, that's... He, he knew so much about fashion. He knew about staging. He knew how to control an audience in the best sense of the word. So your point is interesting. And I, I loved it ultimately. You know, I, I never was as wild looking as them, but they put me in these wild tuxedos with uh, flowers and different things, big boots. I was in this store in uh, Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles looking for these big boots right before I went on tour. <laughs> and Elton John is there, so I knew I was in the right place. Yeah, and I mean, in all seriousness, you know, this is, this is the first, this is groundbreaking. It's the first pop star who was playing around with gender roles, you know. Queen were doing it like a decade after when that video got banned. Like, you guys were so ahead of the curve. And I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's still shocking to me because the music sounds fresh 50 years later, right? Yeah, incredible. incredible. I didn't understand one thing, Eddie. What, um, you said Ricky who? I didn't get the last uh, Ricky name. Wilson. He's the lead singer of the Kaiser Chiefs. Ah, well, tell him to call me. I'll play on his album. <laughs> Brilliant. That's going to go on his show. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> we'll have to get your email at the end of this. So I, I love I love contributing my music. I mean, I played on St. Vincent's for its album, and I played on uh, I, I played with Lord after David passed. So I love great young, sincere talents that love David Bowie, and you know, sort of will be our future. I have never met anyone at his level, and I've been blessed to play with over 800 singers in my lifetime. Wow. And there's, there's David and then everyone else. Right. I mean, there are some great ones I play for, don't get me wrong, both in jazz and in pop, but something about this guy. And David, you talk about deep cuts and things like this, he'd sit with me and say, listen to Scott Walker, because this was one of his heroes. Yeah. And he's this guy's better than me, and he sings better than me. And I like how to talk him down. This is David Bowie <laughs> in 2000 telling me this guy is better than him. Now, Scott was fantastic, but no one was like David. Yeah, nobody. 
Talk me through, Mike, the the first gigs, because, you know, you must have got tight during rehearsals. And um, talk me through some of those first gigs and some highlights and lowlights for you. You're going to love this. So I walk into the first rehearsal and I sit down at the piano and I look to my right and there's stacks of speakers right in my face. Now, don't forget, I'm playing in jazz clubs without amplification, yeah. nothing. So I see these speakers and I said, excuse me, David, um, the PA is pointed in the wrong direction. And the band got hysterical, David got hysterical. And they said, Mike, that's your monitor system. And he points <laughs> to the other place. <laughs> and there was this gigantic sound system that covered the whole room. <laughs> And uh, I thought, okay, I've arrived. <laughs> I've arrived. And, and how did you not get tinnitus after all that? So, um, so yeah, first gigs. Let's talk about some of those early gigs and how they went for you. You know, um, London embraced David more than the States early on, as you know. So some of those shows, as I mentioned, were not fully sold out yet he was building the career and the music sounded very good and he was already experimenting and asking me to play on songs that there was no piano on like my death which is uh, a beautiful song a cover of uh what's his name the french uh the french com uh com songwriter serge gonsberg jacques lebrel, jacques lebrel. Oh, bro. yeah lebrel yeah Labrell, yeah, and uh, he would ask for piano on that, so I was very tentative because I did have a lot of respect for him and the band, and Mick Ronson, who was maybe the biggest uh, unsung hero in rock history, uh, I was admiring his guitar playing, and I, I had to be careful to choose the right notes that didn't get in the way of him, no less in the way of David. And they loved it. So it was the creative process was there from the beginning. The audiences started to get it. And by the following tours, we we're off and running. But I'll never forget the first show in Cleveland. This is the first show. So we finished the last song. The band takes off down some elevator going down to the garage to get out of there. And all of a sudden I see thousands of people rushing the stage. The band is gone and I'm at the piano gathering my music because I was just learning all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden I see this mob coming at me. So I grabbed my music and took off. <laughs> it was unbelievable because I was, I was still on stage, you know? Never so I, I, I knew, I knew this is, you know, I grew up with Elvis Presley and the Beatles and all of a sudden this is someone at that caliber. Right. I was, so, I, I mean, I was going to say, um, I think actually you've given me an image there of a, you know, of a, of a man running incredibly fast in high, in platform heels, which is hilarious. But um, at, at what point, Mike, did you think, because of course you, as you say, didn't know David when you came into this. At what point did you think we are onto something really special here? I think I knew from the first rehearsal, honestly. What? It's just, uh, it was undeniable. The band was tight, Mick soloing. You know, think about that. The highlight for me in the Ziggy movie is Mick's solo on uh, With of a Circle. Think about it. I mean, he just, David let him play for like seven minutes or something, <laughs> and he was changing outfits, you know, and then also be on stage listening to him. So the the, they had done their homework. I had done my homework. And uh, it was history being made. Now, as someone in my 20s at the time, did I have any of these thoughts? No. I just was trying to play the best piano playing I could do to support him as an artist. That was I never thought of anything. I had no idea I'd be opening the show at Hammersmith 50 years later, playing the same medley I played 50 years earlier. So it's all... It's also, it's, it's emotional for me and wacky and uh, I still don't get it, but I owe a lot to David and I miss him. 
Oh, wow. Gosh, yes, much missed. Um, uh, you've preempted my next question, which was that, you know, things often look very different from the inside of a thing than from the outside. And while we all, especially with the benefit of hindsight, know that history was being made, cultural and music history was being made. But you say you weren't, you just were not aware of any of this when you were in the thick of it. You were just trying to do the best job you could. And nervous and uh constantly making sure that I played my parts right because I recognize I'm with a great artist and a great band and uh, it was very humbling and who, who, who knew what history was going to show you know I, I, and I had glimmers of it but I didn't want to have delusions of grandeur but you, you, you can't uh, deny when you see a genius. That's the simplicity of it, you know. Do you know that I've played with the Bowie alumni, I would tour a lot the last four or five years all around the world with whoever were the remaining living uh, alumni, and I had maybe a hundred different singers and actors like Gary Oldman and Evan Rachel Wood. Every one of them had a story about David, and every one of them was influenced, whether it was an actor or in fashion, or in obviously singing. And my whole life, that's all I've experienced. When I talk to Trent Reznor, when I talk to Billy Corgan, when I work with Gwen Stefani, they all have this admiration. I don't, and I, I don't think anyone in history has had more influence on other artists than David, and still to this day. Yeah. So that's actually, one of his biggest contributions because he was laying the future out for all of us and still is and you don't see that from any other artist no oh, you're absolutely right i couldn't agree with you more and i think beyond that that he was maybe holding the fabric of the universe together because after he went the whole world went to sh <laughs> I'm just gest I'm gesturing broadly at everything, same as you. <laughs> but you remember, he went, and then Trump happened, and then we had Brexit, and it's just a whole. Everything went to absolute seven shades of. Sh David, no, we all miss don't, you. Don't think I didn't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> so give me. So now you know. You even though you're not aware of it, you're making musical and cultural history. Give me like a really sparkling highlight, personally, from your point of view, of being in the hottest band in the world at the time. Well, when we came to the Hammersmith to do that last show when he decided <laughs> he was done with that band. And I was the only one who knew that. And I felt bad for my friends, the spiders, that it was over. Uh, I'm fooling around in the afternoon in rehearsal, playing some of his songs on the piano. And he comes up to me, he said, I want you to open up the show. I'm a little nervous. I want you to open up for me playing Ziggy, John, I'm only dancing, Changes in Life on Mars, and just make a piano medley of it, like an overture, like in a Broadway show. I said, are you serious? And he was serious. I opened up the show, it was very successful. I mean, so many people were at that show from Barbara Streisand on down to some of the Beatles and Rolling Stones. I mean, it was beyond. And he told me after I played and after the show, he was more nervous for me than himself because he could feel I was like shaking. Wow. So, Mike, he told you and he didn't tell the other. So did he trust you more? Was there a level of trust that he had with you more than the other spiders? Well, also, he knew I was continuing with him. So he had to say because he didn't want to lose me at the time because he already was picturing pinups and diamond dogs and young Americans. I mean, he he had it all laid out. He's had a very good business mind, you know, aside yeah. from his, his genius of his creativity and wow. great singing, great songwriting. So he had to tell me and it was awkward. But I knew it wasn't personal against the guys because many of the albums, as I said before, that I didn't play on, you, you take it personally at that moment, and then you realize, no, it's part of his palette, and this is who he wants then, and this is who he wants now. And you got to respect that. Yeah. So, you know, you, you knew you were going to die and be reborn. But the others, how did they... The re resurrection was there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So how did the other guys take it? Not good. 
<laughs> not good at all. Yeah, I can imagine. Cause they uh, just... I guess the, the, the word would be shock. Yeah, because they were flying, you know, you guys were flying high, headlining yeah. the Hammersmith Odeon, and everybody wanted a piece of you, and then suddenly, boom. I mean, think about all the rock bands since then that have retired five times, <laughs> and they copy that template. We're done, and then two years later, they're out again. Not David. He actually meant, <clears throat> meant what he said, and he went on to different music. Yeah. Yeah, the jam would be the only one that I could think of that is a sort of a parallel where Paul Weller just killed it. And, you know, Bruce and, and Rick were absolutely devastated. I think still are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so on a personal level, you know, I felt terrible for Woody and Trevor and Mick. You know, I knew they would still go on and play a lot of music and they each did different things. I mean, Mick Ronson played with Dylan, but there was a magic that the two of them had together when Mick and David were singing. Sometimes I didn't know who it was. Yeah. They blended so perfect. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, gosh, you know, there's this quite poignant moment in the film where the camera zooms in inevitably on a girl in the front row who's screaming. But I thought it was very poignant. She wasn't screaming, David. She was screaming, Mick. You know, he, he was a superstar, wasn't he? Incredible. I mean, how do you feel about it now? You know, thinking, God, I was in a band with with just such incredible, incredible people. Well, I was very fortunate because even after they left, Mick went to do two solo albums over the next few years. And I played on both of them, Slaughter on 10th Avenue and Play Don't Worry. No, that's so we great. continued our musical relationship and I toured with him. And it was fantastic, but nothing like the magic of him and David together. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so you get to die, Mike, you get to die twice in your life. And who can, who can say that? <laughs> so let's, let's just focus in on that gig. You say you remember that moment with that girl. So like, just yes. take me through the, your memories of that gig, the sights and the, and the, and the smells and the sounds. Well, everyone in the audience looked like David, so I thought, this is some kind of a freak show, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All the makeup and the Aladdin Sane stuff and uh, the red paint across their face and their head and the outfits and the colors of the hair. I, I mean, it, you got to understand, coming from jazz clubs, this was a shock, a cultural shock to me. But I got it, and, and, and there's such... It's an event, just like these days you'll have uh, the EDM stuff and the raves and all this kind of stuff over the years. This was that for that period of time. Right. And I guess the avant-garde in you was feeling that and was receptive to that, right? I really did because I wasn't just a jazz musician. The music, whatever the music was, and what I was hearing, let's say, in my inner ear and what I wanted to contribute, I had no boundaries like pop, rock, soul, gospel, avant-garde, a, a classical. Nothing was stopping me from playing whatever I felt would contribute to his music. So uh, and that was where I had a, a more open viewpoint than, say, your typical jazz musicians, which I was, and, and, and it has a certain elitism and snobbiness about it. I understand why, because they're very great and trained musicians, but to me, the reach to the audience and that, that reciprocal energy uh, is all part of the music, and David knew how to tap into that, and I do from the piano, it's just not in a a, a grand a grand way it's just coming from the notes that i'm playing and my my desire to reach people and think back to that the sound was it as bad on stage as it was off the stage at the front of house at the beginning of that of that show how do you how do you remember the gig as a musician you know did you did you enjoy it sonically just shoot me <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Just <laughs> and they've not been able to fix it in the film. It, it, it's a musician's biggest nightmare. Uh, if these engineers and 
would only understand this is our instrument. This is all we have. Make us sound good. And and the sound was a nightmare. You do the best you can, and you have to move it out of your mind when you hit the stage. Because there were shows that I did in my earlier part of my life where I just couldn't play because the piano was out of tune or the sound was bad. And once you're there, you can't do anything about it. And you're there to serve, be a steward of the music and a channel and you have to let the music flow, so you almost have to place it, but it's a very difficult barrier that's in your way that you have to move to the left and just say, F*** it and go for it, you know, <laughs> and, and, and that's what we did. But aesthetically, to me, it just wasn't pleasing. You know, you, you said it before we even got on the air, and, and you're the first person that's been honest enough to say what I had been thinking for 50 well, that, years. That's because I'm a musician. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I've been in that situation you know there's nothing I love more than a really good front of house guy you know the, the one that really knows what they're doing or girl actually in these days that's right so that's right. um so many David Bowie fans uh say that Ziggy was his greatest moment so I'm assuming that you know you must have done a pretty deep dive fairly shortly after getting the gig and found out much more about him and his music and obviously then you were playing it uh, every night on tour how what do you feel was david bowie's greatest moment he's because he of course he had so many he reinvented himself so many times what was the one that stayed stays with you the longest well obviously historically it would have to be the ziggy period and aladdin saying and all of that but i actually felt some of his music and his voice when it was a little lower. Some of his music that we did in the 90s, like Outside and Reality, uh, Black Tie, uh, White Noise, um, some, some of his creations in songwriting, the album Hours, nobody even knows these things compared to Ziggy. And I think over the next decades and centuries people are going to realize it wasn't just the ziggy thing but because of the zeitgeist of the time the same as the beatles you can't you can't separate those two so historically and culturally and what he did he was really making it safe to be who you are and now people are still talking about it and trying to do that so he was so way ahead of the curve but in terms of music some of the things that we did you take a song like Stranger When We Meet or Motel or I'm Deranged or Small Plot of Land or Bring Me to Disco King, they're as great as any of the songs he wrote. So, so, and of course, before Ziggy, you had Space Oddity and, and the Hunky Dory album. Uh, the production of that with Ken Scott was beyond belief in the way Ken Scott uh, mixed me uh, by piano playing on Aladdin Sane and Lady Grinning Soul and Time and Let's Spend the Night Together. I owe a big debt to him because you're in the hands. There's an example of an engineer and producer who knew how to make sound right and better. And uh, so it takes a village, let's face it. Yeah, wow, gosh. And you know, with Bowie, and you can't say this about hardly anybody, it was just, it was about so much more than the music. You know, there was the obvious thing about his, his, his fashion that went alongside it, but more than that, and you just touched on it, he made outsiders pun intended feel okay about that right you know people Still who are was. different and i was one of those people you know i was always different i was a, an outcast in many ways it, ethnically i was half cast and i was always into like the indie the, the, you know the music that people weren't into and i you know i was kind of bullied or, or whatever and someone like david bowie makes us outsiders feel good about ourselves right Absolutely. I mean, history will show that might be his biggest contribution because look look what we're dealing with now at the communities and the LGBT and all this kind of stuff. I mean, he was the guy that was saying, fine, that took a lot of inner strength yeah. on his part because... Uh, because people. it was it, it was verboten then that was i mean it, 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 we can't stress this enough it was absolutely verboten to be gay at, at 
you know, outwardly and admittedly at that time. It was, I mean, it was still, you could, you could get beat, birched for it in these parts of the UK then. That's right. There's still plenty of parts of the United States in the middle of the country where the same thing happens. Oh, God, but, yeah, don't, don't let's get started on homophobia in America because that's a whole... We'll save that for another Yeah, that's a whole show. That is a whole show. So, Mike, looking back on it now, how do you feel? I feel honored to be able to be asked to open the show for this movie because... It's somewhat like a sweet revenge. I'll tell you why. When I played the medley in 1973, they didn't film that part of the show. So I never ended up in the movie. But my piano playing is there through the show with the spiders. Uh, so you hear me. But the medley that I did, which was seven minutes and 45 seconds, never got into the movie. So I'm getting a chance now to play it at the Hammersmith July 3rd and 600 theaters all through Europe and of course the UK will get to see what my intention was then and hopefully I've made the medley even better um, doing the same four songs I did back then but I've added three from Aladdin Sane because also it's 50 years since that album's release so it's not only 50 years since the Hammersmith show where he ended the band it's 50 years since Aladdin Sane so I'll have an eight song medley and uh, I'll play for eight minutes then we'll have a little panel and then we'll uh, watch the movie and wow. listen to the sound <laughs> what a trip <laughs> laugh at the sound at the beginning but at least it gets going well what a treat for everybody who who comes for 5,000 people who will come to, to to that iconic venue so um, let me ask you this like um, we're, we're, we're shortly going to land this plane but um, let me let me hit you with a couple of big questions right so it, yourself aside who was the best musician in that band? Mick, of course. I Mick thought Ron's. you'd say I thought you'd say that. I mean, it, it's not even close, you know. Mick was a very good piano player and his string writing, that's his string writing on Life on Mars. Brilliant. So he arranged the strings on that? Yeah. Wow. Wow. He, he also arranged the strings on C. Emily Play from Pinups, where I have a wild piano solo, and he made me sound better. You know, you put the strings behind my crazy piano playing, it's like insane. And he he knew how to, how to structure that. And uh, I'm telling you, Mick was, and his guitar playing, his, his sense of melody and the heart that he had when he played, uh, there's been very few since then that have that. There's been a lot of great guitarists and a lot of virtuoso guitarists, but there was something when he played, it was almost like a violin It would sing, even when he was blasting at 11, you know? Wow, wow. What was your favorite song to play back then? Uh, t the two would come to mind were Life on Mars and Changes. Right, oh yeah, of course. And you're playing... Um what's his name uh rick wakeman's line right life on mars what a chord progression that is i think that's the might be the greatest chord progression ever i think so you know you're going uh, and then all of a sudden yeah and that's where mick brings in the cellos and all that i mean it, it's a production but mind you i played that song 200 times with david and i played it different every time <laughs> I love that. I love that. And finally, what if if you could only listen to one David Bowie song, listen to now, what would that be? Well, so it changes every week. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes it's Motel. Sometimes it's uh, Strange Women We Meet. Sometimes it's Space Oddity. Sometimes it's Aladdin Sane. Sometimes it's... Uh, Lady Grinning Soul. Uh, sometimes it's Bring Me the Disco King. Uh, sometimes well, it's things that I didn't play on, like Man Who Sold the World or uh, Seven from the Hours album, uh, Thursday's Child. I mean, I, I've 
try to think of just one song that probably, like you said, structurally and harmonically, the best song is probably Life on Mars, but there are so many other songs that do so many things. Uh, people don't know it, like, uh, is it The Loneliest Guy on the reality album? It's so deep, nobody has ever mentioned it, you know? I love that you're you're as fluid in your answer as David Bowie was in his whole life. And I have a feeling that he would have really loved that you answered that particular question in that way. Well, we're connected and I feel his presence many times and I feel he's guided me uh, and my career, even though I'm 77, feels like it's just beginning because this show coming up means so much to me. I turned down 100 concerts this year because they had no meaning for me. This has a meaning. Oh, bless you. Well, it sounds like you were lucky to find each other. You know, that I'll never understand how that happened, but I know it was out of my control. I mean, I, I had the thought that I wanted to do something different so I could simply support my family, but I didn't know it would be something that turned out to be somewhat historical, you know? I mean, you know, who, how do you know these things are going to happen? I'd still be playing music if I never worked with him, but no one would know of me <laughs> except the few fans I'd have. You know, I have, to this day, a few thousand jazz fans, a few hundred classical fans and obviously with david it's millions of of fans and there's not a day that i don't get an email or an interview that goes by that someone is talking to me about the aladdin sane track it was an absolute honor to go down memory lane with you i've 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 had an absolute blast mike thank you so much for talking to us i appreciate your great questions and love talking about it and i'll end with <laughs> fantastic